Mia Motley was sworn in for a second term as Prime Minister of Barbados this Thursday after securing a landslide victory in Wednesday's snap general election. The head of a secretive British government unit held meetings in Venezuela's capital Caracas to plan for the United Kingdom's exploitation of Venezuela's oil resources. Iranian President Abraham Raisi continued his tour of Russia this Thursday in the first trip by Iranian president to the country since 2017. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Barbados, where re-elected Prime Minister Mia Motley, as well as Attorney General Del Marshall, were sworn in by President Sandra Mason this Thursday, following the landslide victory in Wednesday's general election. The Prime Minister pledged to focus on issues including financial security, nutrition, renewable energy projects and housing, adding that the Caribbean island faces serious challenges in the next 10 to 15 years. Leaders from around the region held the election results, including Carla Natalie Barnett, the Secretary General of the 15-member Caribbean community, who congratulated Motley on her resounding victory. I'd also like to thank the people of Barbados for the very clear and decisive mandate, as I said, that has been given to us as a government. We shall treat it with care, as we have done before, and we shall endeavor to continue the process of transformation if our country is to be able to meet the challenges that we expect to face in the next 10 to 15 years. We've laid out a number of these, but we also recognize that we're living in a very dynamic environment and that apart from those challenges, there is still the aspirations of development that we set as ourselves as a nation when we became independent in 1966, closing the development gap, eliminating poverty from our landscape, ensuring that our children can be educated to the maximum and to the best of their ability, and of course, ensuring that our people have affordable, equitable access to health care, and above all else, that our people shall remain owners in their land and not tenants in their land. And Prime Minister Mia Motley and her Barbados Labour Party secured a second term in office in the snap general election this Wednesday as they won all 30 seats in the House of Assembly, the lower house of parliament, for the second election in a row. The early election was called just a month after Barbados made the historic transition to a republic, casting off one of the final vestiges of British colonialism. The Prime Minister celebrated the victory with party supporters once the results were in, thanking all those voters who had turned out at the polls and stressing that their support was reflective of the achievements of her government. that there are so many of my colleagues who have asked, how have you, in the middle of an international monetary fund program, kept the will of the people and the support of the people with you? And it is because we have found that sweet spot that has combined the best of political strategy with the best of development economics and development policy, with the best of the will of the people of this country, in one simple phrase, that Barbadians believe in fairness, that we shall share the burden of adjustment together on condition that we shall share the bounty of accomplishment together. And on celebrating the win at the polls, the re-elected Prime Minister thanked the people of Barbados for their support and pledged to continue working for the benefit and prosperity of the nation. The fact that we went to Solidarity House and launched a covenant of hope that told you who we were, what we stand for and what we shall fight for was not a public relations exercise. The fact that we settled on a charter of Barbados after consultation with the people of Barbados before we became a parliamentary republic was not a PR exercise. We shall walk the walk and not just talk the talk. 
we shall continue to labor in the great cause of the transformation of the newest parliamentary republic and one of the greatest nations on this earth, our country, Barbados. Thank you, God bless you, and may we continue to prosper as a nation. Please get home safely, and please, please, please continue to monitor that all of the protocols, I love you, I love you, I love you. Good night, and God bless you all. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The head of the secretive British government unit held meetings in Venezuela's capital, Caracas, to plan for the United Kingdom's expected involvement in the country's energy sector once a change of government was achieved. A record of the meetings is included in documents released under the UK's Freedom of Information Act. The heavily redacted texts were finally provided over a year after a request was made. The documents concern what is termed the Venezuela Reconstruction Unit, a British Foreign Office team which was exposed in May 2020 as being headed by John Savile, a former UK ambassador to Venezuela. The unit was created in autumn 2019, shortly after the UK threw its weight behind the United States-led coup attempt against the Maduro government by recognising little-known opposition figure Juan Guaido as president of the country. The recently declassified files again demonstrate how British interest in Venezuelan oil stretches back decades. The Venezuelan government has demanded that the United States return the country's stolen diplomatic assets. Foreign Minister Felix Palacencia demanded that the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, instruct the corresponding authorities to return the diplomatic property plundered from Venezuela in the United States and recalled that these premises were invaded and seized in a move contrary to international and diplomatic law as part of the U.S. government's recognition of opposition figure Juan Guaido. The Foreign Minister also presented evidence of the theft perpetrated in the Venezuelan embassy in Bolivia by Guaido's web representatives with the support of the de facto authorities installed following the 2019 coup against President Evo Morales. At least 18,000 square metres of beach were affected in Peru as more than 6,000 barrels of oil spilled along its coastline following Tonga's underwater volcanic eruption. According to the sector ministry, the oil continues to spread four days after the incident at the La Pampilla refinery belonging to the Spanish oil company Repsol. The oil that initially spilled affected La Ventanilla Beach and other coastal scenery where two natural bed reserves are located. A first report by the National Service of Natural Areas protected by the state shows that approximately 500 hectares were affected. Fisher people, local residents and ecologists have joined the efforts to rescue the affected birds and local wildlife as the cleanup operation continues. We are a group of neighbors who at the same time are fishermen. This is considered our home, and what we are doing is coming together to rescue the species affected, which we are finding along the way. Unfortunately, we have bags of dead animals, but we also find some alive, and we are in communication with the Forest Service, because every time we find animals, we clean them, provide them first aid, what we are able to, and then they take them. Peru demanded compensation from Spanish energy giant Repsol over the oil spill caused by huge waves from the volcanic eruption near Tonga in the South Pacific. Authorities sealed off three beaches on Monday after 6,000 barrels of oil were spilled during the offloading of a tanker at the Pampilla refinery off the coast near Lima. The Attorney General's office said the spill is the worst ecological disaster in Lima in recent times and has caused serious damages to hundreds of fishing families. The accident occurred on Saturday at the refinery off the town of Ventanilla in the Lima region, affecting a three-kilometer stretch of beaches. And the first humanitarian flights arrived in Tonga on Thursday, five days after a volcanic explosion and a tsunami cut the Pacific island off from the rest of the world. Tonga has been inaccessible since Saturday when one of the largest volcanic explosions in decades cloaked the nation in a layer of ash triggering a Pacific-wide tsunami and severed vital undersea communication cables. Two large military transport planes from Australia and New Zealand touched down at the island's main airport, only recently cleared of a thick layer of ash after painstaking efforts. 
Among the equipment on board was a skid steer loader with a sweeper to help keep the runway clear of ash. The United Nations estimated that more than 80% of the population has been impacted by the disaster and initial assessments indicate an urgent need for drinking water. China announced it has provided 100,000 US dollars in emergency humanitarian assistance to Tonga in the wake of last weekend's volcanic eruption. The Red Cross Society of China has provided 100,000 US dollars in emergency humanitarian cash assistance to Tonga. Through the Chinese embassy in Tonga, the Chinese government provided a batch of drinking water, food and emergency supplies as quickly as possible and delivered them to Tonga on January 19. China will continue to provide cash and material assistance to Tonga as per their post-disaster needs and do its best to overcome the impact of volcanic ash and other hazardous conditions and resolve lo logistical issues as soon as possible. Seven days after a nationwide strike, French teachers' unions called a second major strike on Thursday to protest the government's coronavirus testing and isolation protocols. As part of the mobilizations, teachers rallied in Paris to protest against changing health protocols in schools. The move follows a one-day walkout last week that saw half of the country's primary schools close. Teachers accused authorities of failing to establish clear rules that would keep as many students in school as possible, as well as providing personal protective equipment. In response, the government promised to provide five million high-grade face masks for school staff and to hire over 3,000 and substitute teachers, but the promises were not enough to stop the strike action as unions warned that this Thursday would be a prelude to a massive nationwide walkout on January 27th. A long-awaited report on sexual abuse in Germany's Munich diocese on Thursday accused retired Pope Benedict XVI of misconduct in four sexual abuse cases during his time as Archbishop in the 1970s and 80s. In a total of four cases, we have come to the conclusion that the then Archbishop Cardinal Ratzinger is to be accused of misconduct regarding cases of sexual abuse. Two of these cases involve acts of abuse committed during his tenure and sanctioned by the state under criminal law. In both cases, the perpetrators remain active in pastoral care without explicit restrictions on their activities. In our opinion, Archbishop Cardinal Marx, who has been in office since the beginning of 2008, is to be accused of wrongdoing in two suspected cases of abuse. Members of organizations calling for reforms in the Catholic Church and denouncing sexual abuse reacted to the independent report. Yes, that was shocking. Of course, I had expected more or less what was to be said, but then to experience once again in this clarity how the lawyers take part in this edifice of lies that has been erected to protect Benedict XVI, that was very impressive and also very moving. We already suspected all this in our circles anyway. The responsibilities were also already clear to us. But if one hears it again, and if one can read it in black on white, then it develops again a force and a dimension which are really shocking. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi continued his tour of Russia this Thursday in the first trip by an Iranian president to the country since 2017. As part of the trip, President Raisi denounced NATO's illegal penetrating of the territories of independent states, warning it could lead to the disintegration of the organization. After his visit to the state Duma, the Iranian head of state pointed out that the agenda of the Western military bloc includes opposition to independent democracies and a refusal to recognize national identity, culture and popular traditions. He also stressed that cooperation between Moscow and Tehran in Syria can become a model for bilateral relations in other areas. Iran, Russia and China will hold joint naval drills in the Indian Ocean for three days from Friday as the Allies seek to reinforce their common security. The announcement of the maneuvers coincided with Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi's official visit to Moscow, where he said Tehran has no limits for expanding ties with Russia. The drills also come during talks in Vienna aimed at salvaging the 2015 nuclear deal between Iran and world powers, including Russia and China. That agreement had offered Tehran 
relief from crippling international sanctions in return for deep curbs to its nuclear program. The three countries are facing escalating tensions with the West as the United States continues its strategy of pressure and provocation. A spokesman for the drill said they would include the participation of 11 naval units from the armed forces of Iran, three units from the Revolutionary Guards Navy, three units from Russia and two units from China. The Russian government warned on Thursday that speculations about an alleged imminent attack on Ukraine are a smokescreen that the United States is using to prepare its military provocations in the region. Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Sakharova told a press conference that high-ranking Western and Ukrainian officials have been putting forward speculations about an alleged Russian attack on Ukraine in order to create a smokescreen of information as they prepare their own military provocations, which would have dire consequences for regional and global security. In line with this, NATO member states such as the United Kingdom and Canada have been sending arms and troops to Ukraine, where the United States has pumped some $2.5 billion into the country since 2014, when Western-supported fascists led a coup. At the moment, the Western and Ukrainian media, as well as officials, have become even more active in replicating speculation about the imminent Russian invasion of Ukraine, as they put it. We are convinced that the goal of this campaign is to create an information cover for staging large-scale provocations of their own, including those of military character, which may have extremely tragic consequences for regional and global security. We also do not rule out another communication between the two presidents. We believe that in any case, such communication can only be welcomed. It is useful for both states, and we also do not rule out that after we manage to read the above-mentioned documents, the heads of state will consider it expedient to contact each other and discuss. President of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jamat Tokayev, reiterated on Thursday his commitment to human rights, following the violent destabilization attempts that recently shook the country. Tokayev stressed that his government embraces law and order as the fundamental basis for the stability of the nation. The statements followed the publication of a draft resolution proposed by the European Parliament to impose sanctions on Kazakh officials for alleged violence against protesters. On Twitter, the Kazakh president stressed that Kazakhstan remains committed to its international obligations and universal principles in the sphere of human rights and supremacy of law. Sudanese protesters rallied on Thursday, denouncing the killing of dozens in a post-coup crackdown. The latest rallies came as United States diplomats visited the country in a bid to pressure the military into restoring a transition to civilian rule. U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Molly Fee and Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa David Salterfield held meetings in the capital Khartoum with the bereaved families of those killed during the protests. The U.S. suspended $700 million in assistance to Sudan after the October coup as part of wider international punitive measures. Thursday's protests came following calls by Sudan's main civilian bloc, the Forces for Freedom and Change, for demonstrations in tribute to those killed. Some protesters gathered outside the United Nations headquarters in Khartoum with banners reading No to External Solutions and called on the UN Special Representative to Sudan to leave. Last week, the UN official launched consultations with Sudanese factions in a bid to resolve Sudan's political crisis, which was welcomed by the ruling military junta. Zimbabweans continue to suffer the crippling economic impact of United States sanctions. For 20 years, Zimbabweans have slipped into further poverty, their economy crushed by unsustainable debt and hyperinflation. Like in the rest of the world, where United States sanctions are imposed, they have far-reaching consequences impacting on ordinary Zimbabweans. President Emerson Manangawa, who succeeded Robert Mugabe in 2017, has called for an end to rules which block banks from lending money to the country. But the U.S. government continues to make demands, including for $9 billion U.S. dollars in compensation to white farmers whose property were seized during Mugabe's land reforms. As the population continues to suffer, the US refuses to carry blame for Zimbabwe's economic state. We used to employ over 350, 350 employees here. We are now down to less than 50 employees. Just that tells you what sanctions are. We used to train refrigeration mechanics, and all the refrigeration mechanics that we've trained, which are much more than 300, They've all left the country and are working all elsewhere outside the country. Don't want conditions to be given to the government or the people of Zimbabwe to say do this or that will remove sanctions. Actually, especially when it's being done by the so-called people who claim to be masters of democracy and human rights, yet they fail to uphold the things that they preach. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesoenglish.net. And you can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. 
I'll tell you so English, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.